Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, so as I said, I'm going to talk about um, railway signalling in the UK, and I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of learning from accidents. It's often said that safety regulations in, in most industries are written in blood because they're all based on the accidents that have happened that have caused injuries or deaths. And we're going to look a little bit about how that's influenced the development of UK railway signalling. So just to whiz through a few little bits to begin with, um, this is the inside of a train uh, cab where the driver sits. You'll notice uh, there's no steering wheel. So for those of you who hadn't realised, railways run on rails. So uh, <laughs> I suspect in this audience most people know that, but you'd be surprised how many people in the general public don't realise that. Um, so signallers um, do multiple things of getting trains where they should go and getting them there safely. And uh, to control where trains go, they use points, which are bits of movable rail. So here you can see that you can go off to the left or you can go straight ahead. And the way this works, you can see in this little animation here, you've got those two bits moving in the middle of the track and you can either go straight ahead or to the right or straight ahead or to the right. So, uh, as I said, the purpose of signalling is getting trains where they should be going. There's no point if the train going to London actually ends up in Birmingham instead. Uh, but also getting them there safely, in one piece, at the right time, uh, with no accidents and no, no safety incidents. But I guess the first question is, do we really need a signaller at all? And early railways didn't have signallers. They were very simple railways, they were very small railways, they were very slow railways. So if you don't have many trains, they're not really likely to, very hit, likely to hit each other. And if they're going really slowly, then if they do hit each other, they're not going to cause any damage. So maybe you don't need a signaller. And if you're going to choose where to go, the driver just slows down when he gets to a set of points, gets out and pulls a lever that looks a bit like this, um, and then gets back in the cab and carries on his journey. But when we started having intercity railways that started carrying more people at faster speeds, we really started to need signalling. And the first of these railways in the world was the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, which opened in 1830. And in those days, they had people who took dual roles of doing security on the railway and doing signalling. And they were policemen, basically, and they were known as bobbies. And you'll still hear, hear signalmen on the railways today referred to as bobbies. And they were spaced every mile along the track, and they gave simple signals to the trains with their arms or later on with red and green flags. And they had simple levers by the track they could pull for the points just to stop the driver having to get out and do it themselves. Um, these were some of the early sort of signals that were then used when they moved from um, flags and arm signals to actually fix signals. These are early forms of semaphore signals which look just like a, a flag stuck out or an arm stuck out. Um, and you can see here on the left we've got um, the danger position is it sticking out horizontally. Uh, caution, so warning you you might need to stop soon, uh, is diagonally down. And all clear is uh, where it's hidden inside the uh, post of the signal. And this is kind of what these things looked like. You'd have a signal box with the signals mounted directly above the signal box and a little man in the uh, signal box pulling levers to control those signals. Now, this takes us on to our first accident. Now, at this stage in railway history, I could have picked any number of accidents because there were loads of accidents in those days and loads and loads of people got seriously injured or died. Um, but this one is the one I've picked. Uh, Abbott's Ripton on the East Coast Main Line, uh, 1876, 13 people died, about 50 people were injured. And basically, the problem was that you were using the absence of something to say that it was safe to continue. So you were saying here, if you can't see the signal because it's hidden inside the post, then that's great, carry on, drive at full speed. That's fine until the signal fails in some way, like in this case, it froze inside the post and couldn't come out. So the signal froze at proceed and the, uh, and the drivers carried on and, and there was a crash. Um, so after this, they moved into different types of semaphore signaling, um, keeping the signals at danger all the time and only clearing them when they needed to for a train, um, and also various other things like, like better brakes. But I mentioned about how they used these signals, but how did they know, how did the signalman know whether to set the signal to stop or go? Well, in these days, they used time interval working, which is exactly what it sounds like. Count how long it was since the last train, and if it's been less than 10 minutes, stop the next train. If it's been kind of less than 20 minutes, proceed at caution. If it's been more than 20 minutes, off you go full speed. That's fine until a train breaks down somewhere and the train behind is at least 20 minutes behind it, but catches it up and goes straight into the back of it. 
and there were lots and lots of accidents with this. It was not fail safe in the slightest. And the thing that really moved this on to the next stage of railway signaling was better communication. The electric telegraph was developed in the early 1800s. Um, it sent pulses down a wire of electricity, which was used to move a needle. Uh, this could be done in various ways. It could make a little bell go ding, or it could point to different uh, letters on a display. You could send messages that way. Um, famously, in 1845, it was used to catch a murderer by sending a message from London Paddington Station saying, the murderers just got onto this carriage of this train uh, down to the next station, and then the police got on at the next station and arrested them. And this could also be used for signalling. So here you've got a um, set of railway tracks on the bottom there uh, with four different signal boxes, one, two, three, and four. Um, when the train, the orange train, comes up to the second signal box, it's going to be given a red signal because the blue train is still in between signal box two and signal box three. But as soon as it goes past signal box three, signal box three can send a message back to signal box two saying, the train's gone past me now. The section between you and me is now empty of trains. You can let your train go. And that's what these areas were known as. The, the sections between signal boxes are called block sections. And they developed a method called absolute block, where the rule was there was absolutely only one train in each block section at a time. And they did this by signal boxes sending messages to each other on the telegraph system um, saying, hello, I want a train to come into this section. Is it clear? Oh, yes, it is clear. I'll accept it. And then when the train actually went into the section, there would be a message saying the train has entered the section. And then one later on saying the train has now left the section. And along with this, they had a set of, of new style semaphore signals, um, distant signals and home signals or stop signals. Stop signals are what they sound like. It tells you whether you can stop or go. Distant signals give you a caution. They warn you that the next signal is going to be a stop signal. And that's because trains can take a long time to slow down. They go very fast and they're steel wheels on a steel track. Their stopping distance is quite significant, so they have to slow down in advance to be able to stop at a stop signal. A minor issue, uh, which has still not fully been resolved uh, with these semaphore signals, was that everyone agreed that the signal sticking straight out meant stop, but no one could agree on whether sticking it down or up meant go. And so you have lower quadrant and upper quadrant semaphore signals, and you still have those in the UK, sometimes even in the same area, um, different ways of saying go. And so around this time, you developed a better signal box. These are just a few examples of different sorts of signal boxes from different eras, but you, you'll all have seen these at sort of Heritage Railways and, and on the Mainline Railway as well. Inside the signal box, you'd have a big lever frame which controlled all the signals. And here you can see the levers are all painted in different colors, and there's a standard set of colors. So the red signals are these stop signals. You'll almost certainly find those are most of the levers in the frame. The yellow signals are these distant levers that give you a warning that the next signal is going to be red. Uh, black is for points. Blue is for point locks. You really don't want your points to move when a train's going over them, because that will derail the train. So you have an extra little lever that puts a special locking bar into the points. And then any white ones are spare. And you can also see this shelf above the uh, levers with various indicators on it and uh, various other instruments on, which I'll come back to in a moment. But if we just, first of all, look at a signaling diagram um, for one of these mechanical signal boxes, this is Yarmouth South Town, uh, you can see there's lots of different tracks at the station. You can see just about, we can zoom in a bit more, you can see the individual signals and the individual points. And every signal and every point on this diagram has a number, like there's a signal 60 and a shunting disk 17 and a point 34. That's the number of the lever that you pull to operate that particular bit of equipment. Well, how did they operate them? Well, it was entirely mechanical. They used rods and wires. So for signals, there was a wire that went around lots of pulleys and eventually pulled down on the arm on the signal and moved it to a different location. And for points, because they needed to move uh, in both directions in a, in a slightly different way, they had rods, but again, they had lots of couplings on the rods to, to make this work. Um, that meant that you couldn't operate things very far away. So the rule was that a mile away you could operate for signals, uh, but only 350 yards away for points. 
Um, so that meant you had to have loads and loads of signal boxes, because every time you had a set of points, if it was more than 350 yards from another set of points, you needed another signal box to control it. So this is a, a map of Didcot um, near Oxford, near Oxford, just south of Oxford. Uh, if any of you came to the train, came by um, train to EMF from London, you'd have gone past Didcot on the train before you got up to Worcester and, and then led me to come here. And um, this map shows about five miles um, across, and you can see there are seven signal boxes within those five miles. Uh, there's a couple of ones at the end, Milton and, and Morton Cutting, and then you've got about four signal boxes all around the junctions and the stations, uh, the station in the middle of Didcot. Um, this was very expensive because these signal boxes had to be manned by qualified, trained, competent signalmen, um, and they had to be monitored, had to be manned, some of them 24 7, some of them slightly less time. Um, and we'll come to that in a moment as to how the railway tried to get around that later on. Um, there was also a lot of interlocking of these levers. So this means that you can't set up bad routes. You can't set up a train to come one direction and a train to come the other direction straight into it. Or you can't um, put your stop signal to stop without putting your distance signal to caution to warn the driver that your stop signal is going to be st uh, stop, and so on. And this was all done entirely mechanically again. Lots of levers underneath the levers, lots of rods that interlocked with each other, had little notches cut out of them. It's basically a, a Victorian-style mechanical computer. Um, for the communication, they used block bells. So this was using the telegraph, but it just rang a little bell whenever there was a pulse on the wire. Uh, they'd have different shaped bells for different communications to different signal boxes. So you could tell immediately from the bell uh, which signal box was calling you. And they'd have these bell codes. So ding would be call attention. Come on, I'm trying to talk to you. Listen up. Um, ding, 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 three, one would be, is the line clear for a train? and lots of other things, like six bells in a row was obstruction danger, which you never wanted to hear. And also, linked to the telegraph system, they would have um, block instruments, which were used to um, set up a, a display on, in both signal boxes showing whether there was a train on the line or not. And this combination of lock and block, the idea of absolute block signaling and this interlocking, was mandated by the Regulation of Railways Act in 1889. And I've got a very quick video that hopefully you'll be able to hear uh, just to show you what this is like. This is from Exeter West, which is a preserved signal box up near Crewe. Um, so you can see here someone's pulling the lever. So you, you, you um, unlock the lever at the back by putting the little trigger and then pull it. So he's then putting some of these back. That's call attention. So he responds with one bell. So that's a particular code. He then sets his block instrument, sends a code back, and then goes back and pulls more levers. And this is what a signalman would do all day. Now, the bit that some of you won't be aware of and will probably be quite surprised about is that this exact system that was regulated in 1889 is still in use today on mainline railways in the UK. Not all of them, but in some places. Uh, this is an example of semaphore signals at Worcester Shrub Hill Station. Again, if you came through... Um, Worcester, to, came up from London through Worcester to Ledbury to get here by train, you would have gone past that. Um, this is the, the local area of, of railways, in fact. You can see where you are near Ledbury here, going up to Worcester and, and up towards Droitwich. All of the signals in this whole local area here are controlled by semaphore signal box signals from mechanical signal boxes using absolute block signaling. All the same sort of things that were done in the 1800s. Uh, just for a bit of local flavour, if you did come by train and get off at Ledbury, you'll have seen the Ledbury signal box there at the end of the platform. Uh, this is what it looks like inside. Um, Ledbury used to have lots of sidings and an extra junction, so there's lots of white levers that would have been used for those but are now not in use, so they're painted white. But you can see the red levers, black levers for some points, a yellow lever in the, in the end for a distance. Um, and one nice little thing about Ledbury uh, signal box, one of the things you have to do as a signalman is check that your signals are showing the right display. Um, and at Ledbury, they couldn't see the signals because the footbridge got in the way. Um, so they just cut a little hole in the footbridge. And so they've got a window in the footbridge lined up perfectly so the signalman standing in his signal box can check the signal at the other end of the platform to make sure it's showing the right thing. 
Um, just for a slightly more impressive view, this is Worcester Shrub Hill Station signal box. Again, if you came through Worcester, your train would have been controlled by this signal box. This has 80 levers, and very few of them are marked as spare now. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of junctions and things in the Shrub Hill area, and these are all uh, used very, very regularly. So we've got a way of controlling the signals, but we also need to know a bit about where the train is, because at the moment we know it's somewhere in the section between the last signal box and our signal box, but we don't know exactly where, and maybe we need to know. Maybe it might be sitting at a signal waiting for us to make it green, or it's broken down somewhere, or it's sitting on some points and we can't move those points because we derail the train. So we want to know where it is. Well, one way we can do that is just to look out of the window, and that's why signal boxes are built up on the first floor, and they have big windows so you can see the trains. Of course, that gets a bit difficult at night time, in fog, in falling snow, and, and so on. Um, so there's another thing, which is a rule, rule 55 of the original rule book of the railways, saying basically, if your train stopped, uh, and you've been stopped for a few minutes, you have to send your fireman out of your train, uh, up to the signal box to say, hello, signalman, I am standing at such and such a signal, don't forget me. Um, and they would actually have to sign the train register, a, a book in the, in the signal box to say they'd come. And the um, signalman would have to put something in place to make sure he remembered that train was there. And that could be something like this, a lever collar. You can see just circled in blue on the left picture, a bit of wood on the back of one of the levers. That makes it impossible to pull the lever. Or to pull the lever, you just take the wood off again. But the logic there is that by taking the wood off again, you're thinking, huh, why did I put this wood here? Is this reminding me of something important? Oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't pull this lever because there's a train in the way, or whatever. Unfortunately, accidents can still happen. And the worst railway accident in the UK was at Quintins Hill, uh, near Gretna Green in Scotland. This was during the First World War. Um, and one of the trains involved contains a lot of troops going down to Liverpool uh, to ship out for the, for the First World War. And it killed over 200 people. And this was what the railway looked like at Quintins Hill. The little pink box at the top is the signal box. And they had a, a double track railway going to Glasgow and Carlisle. Um, and they had loops on either side, so sort of sidings to put slower trains in. So, first of all, you've got the local train comes up on the main line. Now, what's he going to do with it at this point? The, train, the local train needs to stop somewhere for a while, but there's no space in the loop on that side because another train is already there because there were loads of extra trains because of the war. So he reverses it onto the other line. Now, that's you know, not maybe what you would do every day, but it's perfectly safe. Um, he then has another train come down and puts that in the loop. That's that, that black train at the top. That's coal and empty coal wagons. But then, unfortunately, he then clears the signals for a troop train to come down the main line, straight into that. And then, unfortunately, what then happens is what happens in lots of railway accidents, which is that the accident on one line causes debris to spread across the other line, and a train comes down the other line and crashes into the debris. Um, now, why did this happen? Well, basically, the signalman forgot about that orange train. Now, just to make this even more ironic, that orange train was the train that he had traveled to the signal box on that morning and had got out when it was stopped outside the signal box. But he still forgot about it. Um, the driver did do Rule 55, but the signalman hadn't used a lever collar and the driver didn't check that. Um, there were a lot of other things going on. There were shift change irregularities. Someone was covering for someone when they shouldn't have been. Someone didn't sign the register properly. Other people were in the box who shouldn't have been. But in the end, there was no way for the signalman to know that the train was there, and he forgot it was. So after Quintins Hill, and a bit before, but also particularly afterwards, there was a development in train detection technologies, principally track circuits. So the way this works is you take some kind of power source, a battery or some other power source, and you um, feed electricity into the two rails of the track. And then at the other end, you get the electricity coming out of the track, and you put it into a relay, a signaling relay. And so when there's no train on the track, the electricity goes all the way through the track, out the other end, to the relay, and you mark the signal as green, or you say there's no train there. However, if you put a um, set of wheels on the train, these wheels are metal, 
they've got a metal axle on them connecting them. So they short circuit the electricity going through the track. And rather than going right to the other end of the track, it gets short circuited and goes back to the battery. So in that case, the relay doesn't get any power. And that means that a train must be on that section of track. Now the brilliant thing about this is it's fail safe. It's if the track, if the signal, if the relay doesn't get any power, then there's a train there. So if the battery fails, you just think there's a train there when there isn't, which is far better than thinking there isn't a train there when there actually is. So um, this was used in various ways. It could be interlocked with the points and signals by doing some very basic electromagnet work with the, with the levers um, and do things like stop a set of points being moved while the train is, is going over them. Um, and other things like you can't clear a set of signals if there's a train in the way, that all that kind of stuff that would have solved Quintin's Hill. And you can see here what the diagram would look like above a signal box. These little black lozenges there um, are little lights that light up uh, red when the track circuit is occupied. And this was installed mostly in the 1900s, really. Um, this also, as a slight diversion, is why leaves on the line are a great problem for railways. Um, because leaves on the line insulate um, the wheels from the track. So if your wheels are insulated from the track, they won't short circuit the track, and it will look like there isn't a train there when there actually is. And they also reduce the grip and make it harder to stop. So you've got two problems with that, which is why Network Rail spend a lot of money on things like railhead treatment trains, which go around blasting sand and water at the track to get this leaf residue off. Uh, because it can cause major problems for the signaling system. Um, just as also a quick aside, one other way of dealing with this is using axle counters instead. So these are little things that are mounted to the track, and they count the number of axles that go past uh, their sensor, and they count it in at the beginning of a section and out at the end of a section, and if once you've counted it, uh, uh, you count up for in, you count down again for out, and if the answer is zero, then there's no axles left in the section, and that section is clear. Um, if you want to talk to me later, you can think about why um, the Swiss railway system has a regulation that no train may run with exactly 256 axles. <laughs> I am not joking. You can run a train with 257, but not 256. Um, so anyway, um, moving on, um, the railways, as we got into the 1900s, started to introduce colour light signals. And there were two reasons for that. One was that you can show more than just stop and go on a colour light signal. And the other thing is that you can control them from a long way away because it's just electricity. You're not having to physically pull the levers. For the mechanical lever thing, sometimes you really have to put your back into pulling it if it's a signal that's a mile away, whereas a signal that's 20 miles away can be controlled easily as a colour light. Um, and they introduced something called multi-aspect signaling, where a signal could show one of maybe four different aspects, four different, different views. Uh, one would be stop, which is a red light. Another would be preliminary caution. So this is warning you that the next signal is going to be caution, and caution is warning you that the next signal is going to be red. So you get double the amount of warning. So as trains got faster, they took even longer to stop, and you needed more warning. And you've also got, of course, clear. So what would happen here is you've got a train in the distance there. Just behind the train would be a red signal, so you don't go into the back of the train. Before that would be a single yellow. Before that would be a double yellow. And before that would be a green. And because they were using electricity now to control the signals, they didn't need these big levers to, to actually get mechanical effort. Uh, they could use tiny little levers. So um, these were used in the, in the early 1900s. Um, Liverpool Lime Street actually had them until a few years ago and they were used on the London Underground a lot until a few years ago. Uh, but more widespread than this was something called NX panels, which stands for Entrance Exit Panels. And uh, these are designed in such a way that you don't have to press a lever or button for every individual signal or every individual point. You have a long panel like this that shows a diagram of the railways, on it, so the, all these black lines are tracks, and you've got these little buttons, uh, and uh, buttons and twisty knobs here, and what you'll do is you'll say you want a train to go from here to here, so you press the button at the beginning, at the entrance, the button at the exit, at the exit, and it sets up all of the points and all of the signals along the route for you. So sometimes before you might have had to pull 20 levers for a single train to do a single movement. Now you just press start, stop, and it does everything for you. Uh, the way it does this 
is with a load of relays. It's got entirely electromechanical interlocking, so the relays set what you can and can't do. So again, it won't let you do something stupid like set conflicting routes or set routes into a section that's occupied with a track circuit. Um, and they also use the, the relays to do this entrance exit route setting part of it. And you have a massive relay room underneath the uh, signaling panel um, with maybe tens of thousands of relays in it. And when you're in there, when it's operating, as I have been, uh, you hear all the relays clicking all the time. So when a signalman sets a route, it will go click, 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 click. And when a trainer enters the section, it will go click, 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 as they change the track circuits and, and so on. Um, some of you may remember this next accident, particularly if you lived in, in the south of England at the time. This was 1988 um, at Clapham Junction Station, which killed 35 people but injured almost 500. And this was an interesting one because you had the line going from Southampton to London, and a train came along from Southampton towards London. And did you see what happened there? The signal was green, and as the train came along, it suddenly went red directly in front of it. Now, that shouldn't happen. You should get a warning of, of yellow first. So the train driver stopped at the next signal, even though it was green, and phoned the signalman to go, you know, what's going on? This signal just went back to red in front of me. Unfortunately, while he was doing that, the signal behind him went from red to yellow, and another train came along from behind and crashed into it. And then, of course, as I said before, what happens next? A train comes on the other track and crashes into the wreckage. Uh, now, this was all stuff that should not happen, but signalling upgrades were taking place in the area, and there was what's called a false feed in the relay room. Um, basically, one of the relays was powered by a stray wire which touched the terminal. Now, all the wires should have been um, tied up out of the way when they weren't being used. They should have been, had, had insulation tape put on the, ends, the bare ends of the wires. Uh, but they weren't. The signaling technician had been massively overworked with this resignaling project, and there hadn't been good enough checking or wire counting, and that meant that this, um, this wire could be connected to the relay, giving it power all the time, and giving this what's called wrong side failure. Um, after that, there was a lot of things changed to do with working hour limits, uh, mandatory testing, um, different interlocking methods, and so on. Also, radio communications with trains was a big thing, so that you can send an emergency stop message to a train. But actually, there was a similar accident at Waterloo in 2017. Very similar causes, I mean, but very dissimilar outcomes. This didn't injure anybody or kill anybody. The train was going very slowly, and it went into the side of an engineering train. Um, but it was caused by unauthorized wiring modifications in the relay room, and there hadn't been proper checking and wire counting again. So maybe we haven't learned the lessons from that. So just moving on to a few other things. Um, one other problem you can have is driver error. A driver can see a red signal, but not notice it or forget it or not be paying attention or whatever, and pass the signal at danger. And we call that a SPAD, a signal passed at danger. And one of the worst spads was the Harrow and Wealdstone crash in 1952, which was the second worst accident uh, in, in the UK. And here you had a train sitting in Harrow and Wealdstone Station in, in North London, um, and you had a yellow distance signal and two semaphore signals, both at stop, and a train came sailing right past all three of those and crashed into it. And yes, yet again, a train came on the other direction and crashed into it as well. Um, no one knows why this happened, because the driver and fireman were both killed in the collision. Um, it was a bit foggy, but not massively foggy, and all the other drivers had seen those signals. So whether the driver got confused, or not seen them, or forgotten about them, who knows? But he passed the signals at danger and went straight back into the other train. So to deal with this, they introduced something called automatic warning system. Now this is a set of uh, permanent magnets and electromagnets that are located between the track and the electromagnetic is, is um, energized or not, depending on the state of the signal. And this is picked up by a, a magnetic receiver on the train, which means that if you go past a signal at anything other than green, so if it's at any of the cautions or danger aspects, then you'll get a little buzzer in your cab. Um, the little display will turn out to look like that. It's called the sunflower display, that sort of, sort of black and yellow pattern. Um, and if you don't press a button in the cab to acknowledge that within about two seconds of the bell going off, then the brakes will automatically be applied. 
Um, unfortunately, this doesn't, still doesn't work all the time. Um, there was an accident at Labrook Grove, which a number of you probably will remember. It was one of the spate of, of three or four big accidents that happened in the late 90s, early 2000s uh, near Paddington. And here you had a train um, that was coming out of London and a train going into London. And uh, there was a red signal to wait while train two got out of the way before train one went across that crossover to where train two is. But train one went straight past the signal and crashed into it at quite high speed. Um, now, AWS was in operation here, but because AWS comes up every time you go past anything other than green, it comes up for like 50, 60, 70% of the signals you go past. Because if you're running on a congested railway near London, you're never going to have green signals because there's trains too close to you. You're just going to have yellow ones. So the drivers get used to just cancelling it. Um, it was a signal that was frequently spadded. It couldn't be seen very well. The driver had poor training. There was, some, there was nothing called something called flank protection they didn't have, which should have meant that the, that the points were changed to stop any kind of accidents like that, even if the driver had gone past the signal. And so um, since then, we, they've introduced train protection and warning system, TPWS, uh, which does the same kind of thing as AWS, but a bit more cleverly. It has little transmitter grids uh, on between the tracks, and it deals with overspeed as well. So if a train is coming up to a signal too fast to stop at the signal, then the idea is this will notice in advance of the signal, apply the emergency brake, and the train will still stop at the signal. Whereas, of course, if, you, if your AWS goes off at the signal and you then start slowing down because you, the emergency brake comes on, you're still going to be way past the signal by the time you stop. And this was introduced, it was installed in all high-risk locations by 2004. It's still only at some signals. It's not at every single signal, but it does the right kind of thing. And it definitely has helped reduce spats. So just to finish off, really, in talking about what the most modern form of signaling is, uh, the most modern is what are known as integrated electronic control centers and the more modern version, rail operating centers, which are basically the same as the big panels, but they're all on computer screens, and the uh, signaler uses a mouse or, in fact, a, a trackball to um, click signals on the screen and, again, set routes in this entrance-exit way, so clicking a signal here, clicking a signal there, and it sets the route between them. Um, they um, also, some of these systems have what are called, what's called automatic route setting. So in that case, he doesn't have to set the route for each individual train, but the um, computer system does that for him, assuming things are running to the timetable. Of course, when things aren't running to the timetable, which is quite often, uh, the signal has to do a lot more manual intervention. But the final example of where we can move to with this is in-cab signaling. So this is moving from signals out pardon me, outside on the track to um, signals that are actually displayed inside the cab. And this is the uh, cab of a, of a train here. You can see that little display in the middle. It's got a fairly prominent speedometer on the screen. That shows you exactly what speed you should be doing to then be able to stop at the next signal. It shows you where you have movement authorities, as they're called, and how far you can go all electronically on that. And those are all done by these Belazes, which are between the track, which are sort of passive radio transmitters that communicate where the train is, combined with mobile phone-based data, something called GSMR, which is basically the same as GSM that you use for your mobile phone, but a railway version that's got good coverage over nearly all the UK railway network now um, to send information to the train. Um, the benefit of this is you can move from fixed block signaling to moving block signaling. So earlier, you'd have these block sections that were between different signals or between different signal boxes. And they were static in size. You couldn't change them at all. Whereas moving block, you can adjust the distance between trains based on how fast they're going. If your train's going at 120 miles an hour, it needs a longer stopping distance, so it needs to be further back from the previous train. If it's crawling along at 10 miles an hour to get into your terminus station in London, then it can be far closer to the previous train because it can stop. Um, so you've, you can move from the sort of high speed indication at the bottom there to a, a, a lower speed moving block. And then the final frontier really is automatic train operation. Um, this has actually been running in the UK for quite a long time. The Victoria Line, when it was first introduced in 1968 in, in London, uh, was automatic train operation. There's a button on um, the, train's, uh, the cab display which says ATO start. 
and um, the driver presses that, and it drives itself automatically to the next station. The driver is still there to open and close the doors, monitor the systems, and so on, but he doesn't actually do any driving in normal situation. Uh, the Docklands Lights Railway, you may also know, uh, is driverless. Uh, you can sit at the front if, and, and enjoy um, playing with the, um, you know, pretending to be a driver, as I used to do when I was a child, uh, and still an adult, I think. Um, <laughs> And, um, and this had moving block, and this was since the early 90s, this had a moving block system to get better throughput on this kind of metro railway. Um, so, modern signalling in the UK is a real mixture. On one journey, you can come, say, from London to here, as a number of you may have done. You may have travelled on the Victoria Line, or even nowadays Crossrail in London, which has automatic train, to, train operation. Uh, you then come up through some modern rail operating centres that cover, um, there's one called Thames Valley Signalling Centre, which covers London Paddington up to Digcourt and Oxford on computer-based signalling. You'll then come up through some panel signal boxes around Oxford. You'll then come into a mechanically signalled area at Worcester and Malvern and Ledbury. So you've had all of this on one modern train doing a modern train journey in the UK, which I think is quite amazing, really, just the breadth of, of signalling practice that is around in the UK. So that's really all I've got to say here. So thank you very much. And uh, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards.